Hello everyone, thank you for joining this talk. My name is Ricardo, I'm a software engineer at Collabora, and today I'm going to talk about uh, fuzzing the Linux kernel and how to use this color to fuzz a Linux driver. So let's get started. So before we begin, let me give you a brief overview of what the talk will be about in more detail. First of all, I'm going to start by uh, giving a short introduction to fuzzing in general, what it is and how it works, and why it is a valuable tool uh, in the Linux for Linux kernel development. Then I'll introduce syscaller for those of you who are unfamiliar with it already. And I'll show you how it works, what are its key features, and how to configure it. And once we are familiar with this color, I'm going to show you how to use it to target a specific part of the kernel. In this case, uh, a particular driver uh, in a dedicated hardware board as a, as a test machine. And finally, I'm going to show you how to get results from this color and how to use them. Software testing is a very large area. And over time, it's becoming even more complex and developed, which makes sense because, as you may know, most of the time in software development is spent in maintenance and debugging. And testing is a way to help us reduce both the number of bugs and the time we spend looking for them and trying to fix them. Now, there are many approaches to software testing and different techniques with different goals. Uh, in this talk, I'm mostly interested in using testing as a way to find bugs. Um, in this regard, there are two main methods, or at least two of the most well known and most used, which are unit testing, and on the other hand, fuzzing. Most people is already familiar with uh, unit testing as part of, uh, of the software development process. Um, unit tests ch try to check that a certain piece of code uh, behaves as documented. Uh, so developers and test writers write manually write uh, tests to make use of a function interface and try to cover the documented functionality including corner cases and edge cases in, in function input. And if done correctly, over time, this test will help catch bugs when they are introduced. For example, when a certain feature uh, no longer works as documented, or when a code error uh, is introduced in the path covered by the test. Fuzzing, on the other hand, is a more automated process and doesn't require you to write any kind of test manually. What a fuzzer does is instead is to generate uh, random or semi-random sequences of instructions as programs, including uh, also randomized data inputs to try to trigger uh, certain bugs that went unnoticed in the first place. So the idea is to produce both data inputs and runtime flows that may be similar to the one found in a real use case. Um, and beyond that, that is to uh, also create patterns that trigger bugs in code parts that aren't normally executed in a, in a normal use case, but they are there and have to be found. In summary, it, uh, a fuzzer will try to come up with non-conventional data inputs and interactions that uh, are hard to, to get in a manually written test. When fuzzing the Linux kernel, the test surface is the system call API, which is the part that is accessible from user space. So a kernel fuzzer will generate sequences of system calls with semi-random or data inputs to try to crush the kernel and then uh, it tries to be aware of that when that happens. Now, there are many types of fuzzers and not all of them use the same strategies and the same techniques, but 
in order to make fuzzing effective in a target as big and complex as the Linux kernel, there are at least some number of key features that we want in order to make the fuzzing process more effective. Uh, because otherwise we would be relying only in pure luck. So in order to make the fuzzing process more directed and more informed, uh, we want at least these series of features, which is, uh, first of all, the ability to check code coverage uh, during uh, the test so that the fuzzer can do a directed search instead of a random one. We also want some way of getting information about the source code uh, so that the fuzzer can generate uh, test programs more efficiently. Um, it's also good to have the capacity to generate data input and code sequences in a random but smart way because we want two, the two things here. We don't want uh, something that looks like a manually written test but we don't want a completely random test either. And of course, uh, having a good uh, report generation, uh, it's also important because when the faster finds a bug, it's good to know that there's a bug, but we would also like to have some information about how to reproduce it. Now, of all the kernel fuzzers that are available, Six Color is one of the most uh, recent efforts and it's probably the, the most successful today. So uh, we're going to see how it works and how to use it to discover bugs in kernel code. This color appeared in 2016. It was written by Dimitri Vyukov and it has become one of the most important tools to make the kernel more robust and more secure. It's a coverage guided fuzzer. Uh, we're going to see what that means and it makes use of many uh, kernel debugging features to make the fuzzing process more efficient. Now, what does coverage guided mean? Well, this color, as any other fuzzer, will generate sequences of instructions as, program, as test programs. Uh, in this case, uh, the instructions will be mostly system calls, but this generation process is not completely random. Instead, what it does is to keep track of the amount of kernel code that ran as a result of running each of these generated programs um, and use that information to guide the code generation process. Uh, the idea is to cover as much kernel code as possible. So when this color mutates its uh, test corpus, uh, we're going to see in a while how that works. Uh, code coverage is one of the most important aspects of it. This means that a program that cover new kernel code uh, has a greater mutation potential. Now, in order, as we saw, in order to improve the fuzzing process, this color uses a few kernel debugging features. The most important one is uh, KCOV. KCOV is something you can enable when you are compiling the kernel, when you are building it, and is key to this color. Uh, what it does when it's enabled is to make the compiler introduce instrumentation code all over the, the kernel code uh, so that the kernel can uh, keep track of, uh, the of the code coverage and share this information with user space. Then syscaller will retrieve this information and check the code coverage when it runs one of its test programs to see how effective it was. Another feature used by syscaller are uh, kernel sanitizers such as KSAN, KTSAN, KCSAN, etc when available, of course. These sanitizers offer runtime detection of certain error conditions such as uh, out-of-bounds memory access or uh, null pointer the reference or uh, data races. 
and uh, they are also based in in compile time instrument instrumentation sorry and the combination of an automated tool such as a fuzzer that generates programs and runs them automatically with these sanitizers uh, is already a, good, a very good tool to detect some bugs, some very simple bugs which are not uh, tied to the application logic, but are simply uh, programming errors such as uh, no pointer the reference. And this combination is able to discover new bugs automatically in a very simple way without barely any human interaction at all. Um, additionally, Syscaller can also use the kernel fault injectors such as FailsLab or FaultFutex to make the kernel introduce uh, controlled faults during a test. And what Syscaller does is to selectively enable these fault injectors uh, so that uh, it covers even more code that is it should that normally would be executed only uh, when one of these uh, faults happen naturally. So normally there are very very little chances of getting to this deep code, um, checking error conditions and such, and uh, fault injectors made code coverage of these blocks much easier. Now we're going to take a look at the architecture of, of Syscaller in a global way. Uh, the, the slide shows a diagram of the architecture and you can see uh, it's divided in three agents, which are SysManager. SysManager runs in the host and it starts and monitor and restarts the targets which may be virtual machines instances, or in this case, um, a Linux system running on a dedicated board. So it starts the, the sys faster processes in the targets and is responsible for the persistent storage of uh, both crash reports and the test corpus. Then sys faster runs inside the, the, the test target, which is a completely separate environment from this, the host where SysManager runs. Uh, it keeps a communication channel between two, sorry, two SysManager. So even though they run in separate environments, they communicate between each other. And SysFuzzer guides the fuzzing process and sends uh, whatever input it created that trigger new code, that cover new code, uh, it sends that back to SysManager for storage. And finally, Six Executor, which also runs in the, in the target machine, whatever it is. Uh, it processes the tests program created by Six, Six Executor. Uh, so it ac accepts the program, runs it, and sends the results back to SysFuzzer. Um, the programs here are simply C++ programs generated by uh, SysFuzzer, uh, and they are statically built and standalone programs. SysColor uses a user-defined high-level description of the available uh, system calls uh, described in a domain specific language called syslang. These definitions, this information, lets this caller uh, generate more thoughtful code uh, using reasonable parameters and uh, usage patterns instead of simply generating random sequences. Uh, so, for example, um, the open system call. For this system call, it makes sense uh, to use a path name parameter that looks like our actual file path. Uh, because if we simply relied on uh, inputting random strings for this parameter, it could take forever for the generator to, to create a string that by pure luck looks like a file path. Uh, 
So most of the time, the system call would simply bail out when checking this parameter. And we'd never get to reach the interesting parts of the code of the system call. Um, so here's an example of definitions in Syslang of uh, open, close, and read. You can, you can see that the file parameter doesn't take a stream as an input. Instead, it takes a file name data type, which is uh, defined as a string with path-like formatting, you know, a string that looks like a correct file path. And also the, the system call flags are defined for the same reason, to avoid simply uh, using random integers here, which would cause the, the error, well, the parameter validation code in the system calls to bail out immediately. Um, however, the, the, the fuzzer would, will still use uh, some random numbers in these kind of parameters, especially it will try to input some carefully crafted integers to test the edge cases for these uh, kind of parameters, because it, it can uh, trigger some bugs, it's interesting to do so, but most of the time it will find more interesting results by using the information provided by the user here. Now, assuming that we have a test setup that is ready to be used by Syscaller, uh, for example, a virt virtual machine image. Oh, by the way, this is pretty well documented in the Syscaller documentation. Now to start a test, we have to create a configuration file that describes the target environment and the system calls that we want to enable or disable for this test. Here's an example in the slide. And once everything is in place, we can start syscaller by running sysmanager in the host and pointing it to the configuration file that we just wrote. Once since syscaller starts running, it will take control of the target machine and it will boot it, will configure it and run sysfuzzer in it, uh, keeping a, communi uh, yeah, a communication channel between this manager and this fuzzer. Um, after that, it will start growing the test corpus, uh, generating test programs and running them, and keeping track of the amount of kernel code covered, as well as the possible crashes when they appear. The evolution of the test corpus is influenced by internal heuristics, and also by the priority given to each of the elements that's already in the, in, the corp, in the corpus. So initially, the test corpus may contain all the uh, primitive instructions, very simple system calls, and over time, as the test programs go uncovering a new kernel code, uh, the test corpus is uh, mutated uh, taking these programs as a basis for new ones. Uh, finally, uh, I should also mention that Syscaller starts a local web server with a web GUI that's shown uh, in, the, in the slide, where you can check uh, the current test corpus, the system calls that are enabled, the current code coverage, and also uh, the number of crashes and their reports. So now that we have a general idea about this color, well, we're going to see how to use it for a specific use case, which is fuzzing a driver in a dedicated hardware board. Now there aren't many requirements on the type of machine that we can use as long as it can run Linux and that it has a network link with the host because the host will open an SSH session to, to the target machine. Uh, we can use whatever we want, we want. So I'm going to use a uh, Rock Pi 4 board because the driver that I want to fuzz, which is the Hantro video for Linux 2 driver, runs on that hardware. So 
First of all, we have to prepare the runtime environment for syscaller because obviously uh, syscaller expects the target machine to behave in a certain way, known way for it. So uh, the syscaller distribution already includes some tools to make this process automatic and to generate file system images for different types of targets. Mm -hmm. The uh, create image uh, script in the tools directory can be used to create a generic file system image that is suitable for this color to use. And also, of course, the kernel should be also generated with at least uh, a set of debug options enabled, which is, uh, this is all well documented in the syscaller documentation. And you can see that at least it enables and configures KCOF and one of the sanitizers here, KJSAN. As well as uh, you know, you can enable any other sanitizer that is available uh, in the board architecture or on your target machine that you want to enable for additional checks. Of course, uh, you also need to build all the necessary modules. Uh, in this case, since we're interested in the Hunter Video for Linux 2 driver, I also enabled it. And then you can bring up your board using the kernel and the, system, the, the root file system provided uh, that you regenerated. And uh, my personal recommendation is to configure the, the bootloader so that it can uh, boot the kernel from TFTP and mount a root file system via NFS because of, uh, I don't know, um, you know, I like to avoid uh, relying on an SD card because of the potential where after uh, long test sessions, you know, these kind of targets will probably stay uh, in a laboratory running 24 seven for months. So you want to avoid using non-volatile uh, media that is not too robust. Finally, we have to change some options of the configuration file we wrote before uh, to suit it to our test target, which is uh, the Rock Pi 4 board. Uh, specifically, note that the type uh, option is isolated, which means that it, it's going to run in a dedicated board uh, elsewhere, uh, not in a virtual machine or anything like that. And in the VM section, which is still called VM, uh, our target now is the IP of the board in our setup. Okay, so now that we know how this color works in general terms, we're going to see how to uh, target the fuzzing process and how to make it more specific to a concrete part of the kernel, which is the, in this case, the hand driver. Uh, because unless we um, enable only and specifically the system calls that we want to test in the configuration file that we saw before, this caller will try to generate programs using every system call that it knows about. That means uh, every system call that is described in, in syslang. And this is not what we want because uh, we don't want to fuzz the kernel in general in our board. We want to spend most of the time fuzzing one particular part of the kernel, our driver. So uh, the first thing we'll need to do is to make sure that uh, syscaller knows about uh, the interface for our driver. And that means refining and improving the description of, of system calls. Now, the collection of system calls descriptions in syscaller is something that is a work in progress and is, it's always evolving. So this means that there will be some parts of the system call API which are described in more detail than others in syscaller. Um, for example, uh, the descriptions for video for Linux 2 drivers were created a, a long time ago and uh, 
they are not complete. Furthermore, a video for Linux 2 drivers have a notoriously complex and deep user interface and it's always constantly changing so the descriptions may be out of date and uh, if we use a, a recent driver it will most likely use newer operations and flags that aren't maybe described yet so the first step would be to make sure that our driver interface is properly supported in syscaller that means including the necessary new syscalls and flags uh, described in syslang so that syscaller knows about them and can generate code that uses them um, in the slide there's a fragment or a very simple example of how you can define new uh, system calls in this case 400 as you can see there are some things that are different from the uh, normal open at uh, descriptions in this case there are some parameters that are fixed and uh, there's a specific device file name which makes the test process use that path name directly instead of trying to use whatever randomly generated file name. Now let's uh, talk about device access. Um, most driver interactions in Linux involve opening a, a device file and working on the descriptor returned by open. Uh, the problem with this approach when it comes to testing is that uh, a certain device won't always be accessible through the same uh, device file name. This is something that uh, will probably vary between setups. Um, Syscaller doesn't have any knowledge about the devices in, in your machine, so it makes a, a best effort approach. Uh, by describing uh, system calls using uh, pattern matching to generate uh, file name strings. So for video for Linux 2 drivers, for example, you may find something like uh, that long line on the slide, uh, which uh, as you can see, uh, tries to open slash dev slash video hash, and that hash stands for any number. So uh, that system call, which is actually a pseudo system call, we'll talk about that later, uh, will try to generate open system calls to any kind of uh, file name uh, that starts with slash dev slash video and then a number. So maybe it will start targeting uh, device file names that aren't really in your system. So again, uh, a lot of time will be spent uh, doing nothing, trying to open something that don't exist. And it, it would be much faster uh, if we could restrict the open system call to our particular driver. So a way to do this is to use uh, some UDEV rules so that UDEV will create a uh, known file name for the driver that we want. So this way we can always be sure that uh, we can reach our driver through the same device file name. And we can add this uh, in the box in the slide, something along these lines to the create image script that we saw before in the tools folder to automate the process during image creation. There's one more thing that we can do to make the fuzzing process more specific to our driver, and this has to do with uh, pseudo syscalls. Now, um, please take into consideration that pseudo syscalls, well, incorporating new pseudo syscalls to syscaller is discouraged because it makes the core of syscall bigger, and while it makes it could make, make sense for uh, pseudo syscalls that are general and that can be useful 
for uh, many uses. Uh, in this case, which is something that's very specific for one driver, uh, it's totally discouraged. But still, I think it's good to <clears throat> sorry. I think it's good to show how they work and how it can be used. So, as we saw in the previous slide, um, uh, system call descriptions in Syslang uh, don't need to be exclusively system calls but they also can be pseudo syscalls. Uh, pseudo syscall is uh, simply a function, uh, a block of code uh, implemented internally in syscaller. So uh, when the code generation process picks up one system call and decides to use it for a test program, it simply outputs that call. It's just an instruction and whatever instructions are needed to generate the input data and that's it. But when it decides to use a pseudosys call, what it does is to take the whole uh, block of code and output it in the test program uh, using whatever parameters are needed in any case. So there are some applications of this uh, which are quite important for fuzzing drivers. The first one is that uh, this is a way of generating a static chunk of code uh, that won't be reordered and won't change, uh, like a known sequence of instructions that will always run in the same way. And this can be useful for uh, preparing a setup for a part of the test or to run an operation that it's made of uh, many system calls that need to be called in a particular sequence. And it's also useful to generate input data in a controlled way or uh, even more useful uh, in a programmatic way. Uh, Video for Linux 2 drivers are a good target for, for these kind of things because most of the operations in these drivers involve calling a, a big, long, long number of uh, system calls uh, in a proper order of execution. And some of them depend on the format and the contents of the input data. So leaving all of that to a random process um, will make it very hard for the fuzzing process to converge to a valid input that will reach the inner parts of the driver code. So now that we have syscaller running, after some time, if everything went uh, right, we should start seeing the test corpus growing in the web GUI. And also we can see that the, the, the code of our driver is getting covered. And in case any bug happened, we should see a crash report, hopefully with a reproducer for the bug. A uh, reproducer for a bug is simply a C program that um, triggers the bug when it runs. Now syscaller will try, will always try to, to obtain a reproducer every time it finds a crash. Although sometimes uh, maybe it won't be able to do that because um, the bug may have been triggered because of a race condition. So um, it's not caused by the code that ran itself by a test program, but maybe it was triggered by uh, a certain runtime condition. So it's hard to reproduce simply by running a program and this color can't be sure of that. Uh, or maybe because there's uh, more than one candidate that could have uh, triggered the bug, because sometimes this color will run many test programs concurrently. So it's the interaction between these programs that may have caused the, the bug itself. Still, even if it can give you a specific reproducer for that bug with uh, certainty, it will at least try to give you a high level description of the program that caused the bug. Uh, an example of that is shown in the, in the upper side of the slide. And, um, and also this color provides a few tools 
that uh, uh, can be used to turn these high-level descriptions into standalone C programs, as you see in the in the bottom part of the slide. So with a little manual effort, you can take one of these uh, high-level descriptions and turn them into C programs and try to run them in the target and start investigating from there. The advantage of having reproducers uh, is that they reduce the amount of time that we spent investigating a bug tremendously, especially if we take into account that Syscaller already tries to minimize the reproducer to avoid having a lot of noise during the, the investigation. Finally, I'd like to mention Sysbot, which is arguably more widely known than uh, Syscaller itself. Sysbot is a continuous fuzzer and reporting tool, uh, which has a public dashboard, where you can, you can see it in the link in the slide. And it has proven to be an invaluable tool for discovering new kernel bugs. You know, what it does is simply to run this color on a number of a bunch of kernels in a number of different platforms and keep track of the crashes it finds and report them uh, with all the information it can find about them to the appropriate uh, developers, maintainers and the appropriate mailing lists. And uh, as, you, as we saw before, you know, this color uh, gives as much information as it can about a, about a crash, including a reproducer. And Syspot does that, of course, but it also gives bisection information. So it, it's not only automating the bug discovery process in many cases, but it's also automating uh, part of the investigation about the bugs. That's all for today. I hope you found the talk interesting and that you learned about the importance of Syscaller as a tool for kernel improvement. Any contributions to the project are well received. Dimitri is putting a lot of effort into it and is always welcoming new improvements and developments on Syscaller. So thank you all for listening. Have a good day.